So when it comes to preaching, one thing I hate is sermons that use sports analogies. I find that they get stretched too far and get a little cheesy, so I don't like them at all, except for today. <laughs> so bear with me, all right? Um, the gospel lesson I'm going to call attention to from last Sunday is about the, uh, the father with two sons, and I want to start by telling you about a father with two sons that I worked with. So for 10 out of my 40-plus uh, years of ministry, I worked as co-pastor with another pastor that had two boys. His oldest son loved baseball, and he loved baseball with a passion. He was one of those kids that ate, drank, slept, dreamed about baseball. He even wore his baseball cap in church. <coughs> his dream was to play someday in the big leagues. He wanted to be in the majors. And the truth was, uh, he was good at baseball. Now, the pastor's youngest son was also interested in baseball. And he mostly liked baseball. He liked the teamwork. He's good at it. And in fact, he was really so both sons played ball, t-ball, uh, little league, junior varsity, senior varsity, club ball, and even when they went off to college, good Lutheran college, they played baseball for four years. Both of them were pitchers. For the oldest son, the one who was passionate about the sport, that's where it stopped. He was good, better than most but not good enough. For the youngest son, the one who mostly liked baseball, well, he was much better than most and ended up playing for a farm league for one of the major teams, though he never got called up. So we're talking about good and better and best. Both were good, one was better, but neither one made it to the best of the best. Now I thought about those two boys when I studied the Philippians lesson and relearn Paul's story. Paul talks about how God measures and qualifies us for the life of faith, life in the faith league. You'll discover that good and better and best seem to have little to do with that in this way. In one breath, Paul talks about his passion for the God of Israel, about his faithful service to his Lord. He talks about being the best when it comes to matters of faithful living. He says he was not only good or even better than all the rest, he was the best. He said he made it to the majors when it came to religion, was even becoming a star becoming famous for his drive and his discipline and his zeal for the game of faith. In fact, he saw himself as so good and so faithful that he stood before God blamelessly. A star is what he are. That's what he thought. But then in the very next breath, Paul talks about how he flushed that all away. He stopped patting himself on the back. He stopped listening for cheers and applause. He stopped polishing his faith trophies. He says now, all of that, he counts it as refuge, refuse, as garbage, that it is of no worth or merit, at least not before God. Then he says it's because now He's on Jesus' team. That when it comes to a relationship with God, Jesus is all that matters. All that really matters is what Jesus has done for him and for others and for the world. What really counts now is the gift of faith and trust that God is building within him. 
What counts is the prize of a right relationship of trust and hope and love gifted to him through Jesus Christ. What counts now for Paul is a life of thankfulness, a life of lived in deep gratitude, a life lived in service to the gospel. Only that, only that gift of grace in Jesus Christ, only that makes his life good or better or best of all. From now on, Paul says, to know Jesus, or maybe better to be known by Jesus, to know the promised prize of new life in Christ, well, Paul says again and again, that's the whole ball game right there. In fact, he's so excited about the grace shown to him, he says that even sharing in the sufferings and death of Christ would be worthwhile. Why the sudden change? It's pretty simple and clear, Paul says, because Christ has made me his own. Now maybe to tie this for a second into the kids' lesson, maybe we could say that God loves the little chocolate bar, and God loves the medium-sized one, and God loves the big one, and God would love the biggest one of all, not because of size, but because God simply loves chocolate. <laughs> all chocolate, all of us, right? That's kind of what Paul is driving at. And then comes this, so now what, question for Paul. Now that he belongs to Jesus, now what? grace is so profoundly life-changing for Paul, he says he can to share the gospel and to share every moment in witness and care of others. For Paul, the old way of playing the game is over. God's new game and new way has drawn Paul into it. And he says, now, now I play for the sake of others. Why? Because Christ has made him his own. Here's the deal this morning. Christ has made you his own as well. God, by grace and love and compassion, has brought you as a gift into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's that question. So now what? Now what will it be for you, right? It is not possible to be spectators in this game of life and faith, for sure. Again, stretch the metaphor. Paul says you too have been called up into the majors. That you have a position to play. That your skills, whether they're big or small, your heart, whether it's strong or weak, your willingness to play the game, to play as a team, is what matters most. Because you matter, and this matters. And it truly does, mat does not matter if you're good or better or the best at it. It's simply that you are at it, that you are now in this game of faith with whatever skill level you bring, right? Your goodness, your better-than-otherness, your very bestness, 
Paul says, that doesn't matter about getting you into the game. But however you play, remember that it helps the team, it helps the faith community, it helps the wider community, it serves the world, and it serves the gospel, right? I'm going to reach back for a moment to last week's gospel. You might remember that, the story of a father with two sons. I think it fits the so now what question for us in this way. The father asked one of his sons to go to work in the field. What did the son say? He said yes, <laughs> but he did no, right? So then the father asked the other son to go into the field. And this one says, no way, but later does, yes way, right? He goes and does what needs to be doing because, well, maybe it's because it's his father who asked, and he knows that that ask needs doing. It seems to me in telling the parable, Jesus really doesn't seem concerned about what the two boys said. His focus is on what the two sons actually did in their response. Because when it comes to responding, actions take precedent over words. Remember I said it makes no difference if you are good, better, or best here. What makes a difference is that your acts become faithful and merciful and compassionate and just. That it's thankful self-giving that you're involved in that builds a wider community of faith in Christ and a community in service to the world. Paul says that God's grace poured out on you in your baptism puts you in this game. And it's the only game that really counts for now and forever. So this morning, now that Christ has made you his own, how will you, or maybe you can even spend time, how are you? How are you responding to God's call to get on the field, to get in the game? With Paul, how is it that we might forget what lies behind and with him together strive forward to all that lies ahead for us as friends and servants of Jesus Christ and friends and servants to every neighbor. After all, isn't that the goal that we all dream about? To be found faithful in this game of life and faith with whatever gifts God has given us. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I won't say it. Game over. Okay. <laughs>